From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is on adventures and will be returning. They call me Ben. We are joined as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It's a lovely Friday mid heat wave here in Atlanta, Georgia, as we record this. A uh, devastating heat wave is crossing the United States. Everybody uh, listening in this in that part of the world please uh stay hydrated and uh try to try to stay cool in general you know metaphorically uh figuratively as well as physically but do remember as you're trying to stay cool that there is going to be an electricity shortage a power shortage i mean we're you're in the midst of it right now especially if you're in the west due to Mm -hmm. the hydroelectric plants that are some of which are not going to be functional if this continues some of which are at low levels of output so just be careful out there everyone yes be careful out there uh we're mentioning this because matt today you and i are escaping our fair metropolis uh and we're traveling to scotland but we're not in search of a cooler climb instead we're in search of answers to a mystery that remains uh (laughs) Well, as odd as it is to say it remains officially solved, not unsolved, but officially solved in the modern day. And this is a incredibly controversial, twisting case. Uh, this is, uh, to many, an ongoing conspiracy. Uh, you may have seen the headline of today's episode before you began listening, and it's simply a question. What happened to Willie McRae? Matt, before we start, this is a topic that that you found, and I was really interested. We haven't talked about this before, but I'm I'm really interested to hear how it how it hit your radar. Matt Dar radar, Matt radar, whatever. Yes, Ben, it was actually a listener suggestion. David sent this to us, and I, I'm not going to read your full message to us, David. But thank you very much for sending it our way because that's why we're doing this episode right now. Yes. Yes, thanks and cheers to you, David. So, here are the facts. Before we figure out what happened to Willie McRae, we have to ask who he was. So, who was Willie McRae? It's a name that a lot of people outside of the UK might not be familiar with. Very much so. I had never heard this name before prior to receiving that email and then doing the research. But Willie McRae was very well known. He was born May 18th, 1923. He was a politician and attorney or lawyer, and he did all kinds of things throughout his career. He was a very influential person. He was um, formerly in the military. He worked for several different militaries, uh, or at least in different capacities for, for different militaries. Um, Military intelligence. Yeah. That's one of his specialties. Mm -hmm. And he was best known towards the end of his life as an anti-nuclear activist, politician, and attorney. Yeah. And he was... He was a man with a cause, you know, with several causes. For most of his adult life, he was an active member of the Scottish National Party. The Scottish National Party, which is still around today, of course, pushes for Scotland's independence from the United Kingdom, as well as membership as its own country in the European Union. And And if you find anything online about the Scottish National Party, it will almost always just be abbreviated as the SNP, and it's just a... Uh, treated as a known thing if you're reading any papers out of the UK or mm-hmm. um, or watching videos. Yeah, the SNP. Uh, the the other thing we should note here is that there are allegations of conspiracy regarding the move for Scottish independence. We're going to keep that for a separate episode. But write in if you have 
if you happen to believe that there is something crooked afoot with the move for independence or with the moves, the allegations that the UK is making moves to shut down independence votes and referendums, this is something that McRae fought for uh, and fervently believed in. He was a big fan of independence in general. He'd also been a vocal supporter of the Indian independence movement. Uh, he wrote, he literally wrote the mercantile law of the country of Israel. He served as the emeritus professor at uh, the University of Haifa in Israel. And his influence on that country in particular was so strong that upon his death, people planted a literal forest in his honor. Like they planted 3,000 trees for this guy because they didn't want to forget him. Uh, he was, like you said, Matt, he was perhaps best known in in the UK for his opposition to actions of the British nuclear lobby or the nuclear establishment, particularly the proposed sites of waste dumps and accusations uh, that members of the nuclear industry were breaking the law, especially at the Dunray nuclear site. He was ready, in short, to fight the powers that be. He attempted to root out corruption where he saw it, and just just to humanize this guy. And so you can get a sense of how he sounds, fellow conspiracy realists. We'd like to play a little clip for you. This is Willie McRae himself speaking. He's got kind of a fight the power vibe. You'll see what we mean. Ladies and gentlemen, what did we learn from this inquiry? First, I hope that all of you learned, if you hadn't known ever before, that all of you learned that you don't trust the political establishment in Scotland or in Britain. And that's lesson number one. There you go. That's right. Don't trust him. Guy after my own heart, to be honest with you. Uh, and he, he's a passionate speaker. Uh, he's a passionate policymaker during his career. This is all to say that he led a storied life. And whether or not you agree with him, he consistently fought for what he believed to be just causes. If Willie McRae was alive today, he would be 98 years old. And uh, in my opinion, he would no doubt be st still be fighting for Scottish independence. He would be fighting against corruption in the nuclear industry. But he is sadly no longer with us. Uh, Willie McRae has passed away, hasn't he, Matt? That's correct. He was found inside his Volvo. It was on April 6th, 1985. He was unresponsive. He did have a pulse, but he was unresponsive. He was taken to a hospital, then transferred to another hospital where he was taken off of life support and he died. And really, uh, the name Willie McRae is familiar to a lot of people because of the ensuing investigations that occurred after he was found there and then died and allegations that something was amiss with the official findings. Yeah. Yeah. He's more well known for his death, which is a, a bizarre place to be historically because folks, you see, despite the murky verdict of the official investigation, Initially, they concluded it was suicide. Uh, later, it shifted to kind of undetermined, but uh, the powers that be still says, say it's suicide. Despite those conclusions, a great many people in Scotland, in England, in Europe, in the world believe Willie McRae was murdered. Here's where it gets crazy. So like, like you said, Matt, it's April 5th. It's 1985. McRae leaves his apartment or what you would call a flat, in Glasgow at around 5.30 p.m. to spend the week at his cottage or holiday home at Ardell near Dorney. He's working on his forthcoming book about the nuclear industry. He's convinced it's going to be a banger. And a lot of his supporters and opponents will come to find we're convinced it might also be a banger. Uh, this was Easter weekend, just to give you some context here, and uh, one note as we continue, uh, we are we we went back and forth about correct pronunciations of place names. Uh, Matt, I propose we just we we keep our good old American accents because I I don't want to I don't want to accidentally fall into a terrible 
characterization of a Scottish accent. I watched too much Mike Myers last night, entirely too much. Understand. Uh, I I will do my best to say it the way I've heard it in all these videos I've been watching, but mm-hmm. I will not put on a fake accent. I promise you that. Which is a shame because I love our Scottish accents. I know, I know. I know, but this oh, is a serious oh, what, thing. What was it? Boy! <laughs> Boy! Bring me my pants, boy! <laughs> Love it. Yeah, if we were... <laughs> shout out to So I Married an Axe Murderer. We were talking about that a little bit off air. I, I really enjoyed that movie. I think you did too, Matt. And you had said how funny it would be if your son came in with a pair of pants. <laughs> oh, that would be so great. That would be so great. <laughs> uh, but, but yes, uh because this is a serious uh, episode, we we don't in any way want to diminish the gravity of these events. And these are very heavy things. So McCray is all set right now. We're, we're giving you a version of the story that's going to be somewhat nonlinear. We're going to go back and forth through time. But for now, let's stick with him. April 5th, around 5.30 p.m., he's leaving in his Volvo. He is not seen again until the morning of April 6th. And this is where two Australian tourists enter the story, Alan and Barbara Crow. Okay, so we're there. It's 10 a.m. in the morning. We've got these two Australian tourists. Uh, Barbara Crow, she's really not put off by this strange side of something that looks like a car down on the side of embankment. But something about it, I don't know, made her feel a bit strange. Spidey sense. Yeah. Vibes. They're like, I don't know. The way that thing was angled, where it was placed, we should at least go check on it after they were, went a few miles down the road. They came back and they wanted to just take a look, right? They they stop there and it's about 300 yards from where this object was, where they're from, you know, where they're standing to where the object is. And Alan took binoculars out. So this is key here. They're far enough away that Alan took out binoculars to view the thing, whatever that object was that they think might be a car down there. And it was definitely a car. It was, uh, it was in this, it was straddling this thing that is known as a burn, something you will hear about a lot. If you read about this story, or if you look at the documents, it's um, we're going to call it like a water course, like a stream or um, a small river, a Creek, like a tight, but it's a very small body of water that's leading down into a larger body of water. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, <laughs> it's the liminal space between a large stream or a small river. Uh, this car was facing toward Allen Crow. Yeah, so towards the road. Toward the road, which is important. And so, and it also looked like someone was inside. And what they saw was... McCray's vehicle, a Volvo estate uh, lying on the moor a short distance from the junction of two roads, the A87 and the A887. The car was about 30 yards from the roadway. And, you know, if you're wondering why the crows were 300 yards away, it's because they stopped at a little pull-off site, you know, a, a place where you could get off the main road. And they instantly thought, it appe- like, this looks like someone was in a car accident. We need to help them. So Barbara stayed by their car, and Alan Crow ran down to get a closer look. And there he found a man who had dried blood on his temple, in a disturbing amount of dried blood. And so first things first, Alan tries to revive him. You know, he's like, he reaches out and touches him, and he checks And like you said, the guy's unresponsive, but there is a pulse. He grabs his hand. There's no grip back. It smells as though the man has urinated and defecated. And as Alan is looking around at the interior of the vehicle, it looked like rain had been seeping through the driver's door window for some amount of time. Yep. Uh, Let's just point out right here that it is McRae's right temple at least according to a lot of things I've read where the dried blood right. was, was on him. So you can imagine if you're a tourist in an area you're not that familiar with and you don't exactly have a smartphone, it is the 1980s right now, you've got to alert somebody you know, or get to a phone. 
somehow. So what they do is they flag down the next car that happens to come by. And this happens to be uh, filled with several people, three people, Dorothy Messer. She's a doctor, which is very important. And wow, isn't that like, how great is that? A doctor is just happens to be there. Quite Um, fortuitous. Yeah. Yeah. Her fiance is there. Uh, David Coots, I believe is how you say his name, C-O-U-T-T-S. And there is a counselor, a Dundee SNP, the organization with which Willie is associated, is also in this car. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting about this guy because he actually knows personally Willie McRae because of their, that association. They work together closely. Right, yeah, David Coots, I mean, they're in the same political party, right? David Coots is also SMP, so he is able to recognize McRae. And McRae, according to the reports from from these uh, five people, the three Scottish folks in the car and the two Australian tourists, uh, McRae does not have a seatbelt on. His hands are kind of folded in his lap and his head is slumped on his right shoulder like this. And there's considerable amount of blood again on his right temple. So they send one of their cars off to call emergency services. As we pointed out earlier, this is before cell phones. So they they weren't able to just dial, uh, you know, their local emergency services number. Uh, That's why it's even better that there was a doctor on site. Dr. Messer is examining Willie, and she says he's still alive, he's still breathing, but disturbingly, she notes that one of his pupils is dilated. Why is this important? Because your pupils are supposed to dilate in tandem. They work together. Uh, so when one of only one of your pupils is dilated or when one of them is pinwheeling, then that indicates the possibility of brain damage, right? So she estimated, based on her assessment, There are going to be three assessments of this guy. She estimated that he had been in this state of brain damage for about 10 hours. The ambulance arrives. They take McRae and Dr. Messer to Rakemore Hospital, the first hospital he goes to. Important point. When he arrives there, the doctors do not test his blood for drugs. They don't give him what you would consider to be the uh, a basic emergency assessment. No he, x-rays. No x-rays. That's correct. He is transferred to a place called Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And it's at Aberdeen where the doctors, the nurses, the medical staff realize this is not your garden variety, unfortunate car accident. And you will hear conflicting reports about almost everything we've told you thus far. <laughs> but but a lot of that is established, especially the uh, the Australian tourists and the people who are in that car and their assessments. But some of the details, they get really murky. So we're going to take you through what occurs at this Aberdeen hospital, at least to a couple of different sources. It was initially reported that the nurse assigned to him while he was at Aberdeen was cleaning his head six hours after he had been found. So six hours from the point when those Australian tourists made it down to him, they discovered what looked like the entry wound of a bullet. Mm, And here, yeah, here is where they get their first x-rays. Again, the initial reports say that x-rays confirmed he had been shot right above his right ear and that the bullet was still lodged within his brain. There was no exit wound, and this caused the brain damage. But but here's where we jump through time, because now, with the benefit of retrospect, we know the name of that nurse. Her name is Catherine McGonigal, and in 2018, she went public responding to that, the stories about her, and she said that they were a load of hogwash, Essentially, she didn't specifically say hogwash. I'm just going through a phase where I like to use the word hogwash. But she wash said, those uh, hogs. wash those hogs. But uh, this is with the National in 2018, where she says that the, the basics of the story are wrong, that he was not shot in the temple. Oh, yeah. And the first thing of note that she says here is that the reason why she discovered the bullet wound at all was because she was afraid to move him to get x-rays done. 
and they they were so they were so weirded out that x-rays didn't arrive with him when he got transferred but she as the nurse taking care of this patient didn't want to actually move his head or neck because if it was a car accident maybe there are injuries there we can't move him until we get x-rays and we know and that is the moment as she is they're attempting to just barely move him a little bit to get these x-rays done that they discover this wound yeah exactly and the wound where, where is the wound Oh yeah, this is this is the most important thing. Again, not in the right temple. She's saying the wound is in the back of the neck, like right at the back of the neck. That there's no uh, exit wound. There's just an entry entry wound that is smaller than I think she says a penny piece. Yeah, one penny piece, and it was aimed directly at the brain stem. So like in the back of the head, right at the neck, in the base towards the brain stem, which feels like a. Um doesn't feel like a suicide. So, no. So she she describes this entry wound in detail. She says it's smaller than a one penny piece. And like you said, Matt, directly, directly at that brainstem. As and as we pointed out, she knew she clocks how weird it is that there are no x-rays, and she says to the national, normally if a patient is transferred, you would have a phone call from the doctor, a phone call from the nurse in charge, and x-rays would have been with the patient when they arrived. It appeared to her as if the doctors at the earlier hospital simply had not assessed him at all, and she thought that was pretty off because someone who had apparently been seriously injured in a road traffic accident also had no obvious injuries to the front of his head or to his face. And then we'll come back to McGonagall later. But that is bizarre because usually when you say, you know, someone was in an accident and even if they made it out with just a few cuts and scratches, there are usually going to be some sort of uh, facial injuries. You'll Even if you're wearing a seatbelt, you know, the airbag will hit you. If this is in the time before airbags, then you'll you might break the bridge of your nose or have some contusions when you hit the steering wheel. But if this guy was not wearing a seatbelt when he was driving, he would have definitely had something else. So already, like, medical professionals are smart and they're familiar with a lot of scenarios that a lot of other people don't see every day. So these these questions that are popping up to her, they're very, very strange. There's one last thing we have to mention here with with the stories of Miss McGonagall. And it's just the strange way that she came to realize that she was actually treating Willie McRae. In this interview with The National, she states that for a long time, she had assumed that McRae died at the previous hospital. Uh, But when she read that he had died in Aberdeen, I checked the dates when I was working there and when I left for my course in Edinburgh and realized the nurse who was mentioned in the reports, like in all of these national newspapers, they were about her. So that's a little weird to me, right? Right. She, in the moment, she didn't realize she was treating Willie w- Willie McRae or that he was anyone of note, I guess. Yeah, that's a very good point, Matt, because you know when you read that, you can think, well, maybe memory is playing tricks on someone with the best of intentions. But then you can also – you also have to ask yourself, how many people did she treat in general, you know, the over the course of her career? Many years later, when she reads this – probably the first things that she notices are the discrepancies she noticed on that day. And then she puts the pieces together. But but it is odd. And she's not the only person in this story who comes forward years and years after the fact. But back to, back to this day in April, McCree's vital functions continue to weaken. He has severe brain damage. The doctor's and his next of kin confer, and they have a conversation that everyone dreads. And so on the next day, Sunday, April 7th, the doctors take him off life support, and Willie McRae passes away. This, in many ways, is the beginning of the story rather than the ending. Uh, We'll pause for a word from our sponsors, and we'll return to dive into the questions that circle this case and remain with us in the modern day. We're back. All right. So 
similar to the Chekhov rule for writing a good play, we know that in the course of an investigation where a firearm is involved, you want to find the weapon. And but but yeah, but but there was no firearm, right? Through like through at least the initial investigation, whenever police first went out to that mm-hmm. vehicle, mm-hmm. Um, nobody knew that a firearm was involved or a bullet at, at all was involved. Right, right. Apparently the police did not clock it. Uh, they just, and we'll get into this too, mm-hmm. they, they had moved the vehicle initially and it wasn't until a, a day later that they found a gun. Uh, it's been reported as a Smith & Wesson 45. You may also see reports of it being a Smith & Wesson 22. Uh, I would say, uh, like, I would just say the 22 would make a lot more sense for a smaller bullet that gets lodged in a body. It doesn't have an exit wound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it is, it is weird. Uh, as Ben is saying, like all kinds of different reports about this weapon. Oh, the gun is the gun is a very strange thing. This is this is Schrodinger's firearm. You know, the mm-hmm. Schrodinger side piece. Because what's odd about this is that the the gun that they find first off, they find it a day later, and then secondly, this gun does not appear to have fingerprints on it, and thirdly, this gun is at least when they discover it, to the official story, it is some measure of distance away from the vehicle. Or, or it's right by the driver, mm-hmm. the driver's side window, or and, yeah. it's, it's and like, no, no one agrees no. how far away or close the gun was. It, it, oddly enough, no one does. And some of the investigations contain contradictory information about this. And so... Despite this lack of fingerprints, despite the weirdness about the gun, despite the weirdness about the way the hospital treated him, the official investigation initially says Willie McRae has committed suicide, and they don't hold a further inquiry into it. This seemed unprecedented for McRae to many people. He was on the cusp of getting elected to Westminster and uh, he was making a lot of headway in his anti-nuclear campaign. And, and he was also writing a book. Mm-hmm. Ac- according to, I know, and this isn't the most reliable source, but on electricscotland.com, you, uh, can, yes, read, yeah. you can read a report by someone who, suppose, supposedly by someone who knew Willie, who said he was, that he had just discovered something very important with regards to the book he was writing Again, about the nuclear waste industry or the the nuclear lobby and industry and the waste disposal and all of that. Um, and also that he was on his way to a wedding celebration very soon. So yeah. like, there, there's just a lot of weird stuff there about uh, personal reports of him not being a suicide risk. Right, right. And again... You know, anybody who has had the tragic personal experience of this, you know that there are not always clean indicators, right, Correct. Of, of someone's personal struggles. But I want to go back to this idea of the anti-nuclear campaign, because instead of an inquiry, there was another campaign that began, a whisper campaign, uh, rumors that McRae was a very heavy drinker, an alcoholic, uh, that he was uh, struggling with his sexual orientation. Uh, and still, those those rumors, if indeed a smear campaign it was, could not stem the tide of questions that were rising at a precipitous rate. Uh, and as you said, he had not exhibited signs of suicidal ideation in the past, This immediately becomes an enormously controversial, even conspiratorial topic. So, over the past few decades, his death has been the subject of numerous articles, investigations, books. There's even a television documentary about him out. So, why? Why all this attention paid uh, to, to this unfortunate death? To understand why the circumstances of McRae's death and the official conclusion seems so suspicious to so many people, we really have to understand the background of his political career and his activities in the time leading up to his demise. That's right. We talked about his background a little bit, but Willie McRae was an officer in the British Navy, and 
Uh, oh, you you may recognize this name. He was an aide to Lord Mountbatten before this guy was murdered by the IRA. Um, mm-hmm, interesting. As an attorney, he was fiercely opposed, as we talked about, to storing any kinds of nuclear waste or material or weapons in Scotland. And he also, this is when he became involved with the Scottish National Party, the SNP, and was he was really campaigning for independence. And I, you know, I don't know how closely those two things are connected. I've only read the surface things that have been written about Willie McRae. You know, I didn't know him. I didn't know any of his relatives or coworkers. And he also became involved with that SNP, the Scottish National Party, and was really campaigning hard for Scottish independence. Yeah, yeah. And these were two extremely sensitive subjects at the time. And Scottish independence remains a touchy subject for many people in 2021 as we record this. Because of his connections, people began to believe McRae had not taken his own life but had been murdered, that he had uncovered something the British government didn't want the public to know, and that he might be on the cusp of releasing some nasty skeletons from the UK administration's closet. Can I read a quick little excerpt here from that weird electric... Oh, yeah, please. uh, Whatever it is, (laughs) Electric Scotland. Um, According to the story on this Electric Scotland post... This person says that just before Willie was killed, he had incontrovertible evidence from a source within the MOD, the Ministry of Defense, that plans were in place to build an underwater burial casement offshore in Applecross to store all of the UK nuclear waste. Uh, And he was beside himself and he was going to publicize all of these findings on the weekend. So right before, right after his body is found, or his his car is found with him in it, unconscious. Mm-hmm. And there was something else of what, that didn't make it into a lot of the official statements of the time. In the time leading up to his death, McRae's home and office had been broken into, burglarized on multiple occasions. Uh, he became paranoid. And Matt, as, as you saw, he started carrying his briefcase with him at all times. In fact, on the day he left for his cottage, you know, we said he left uh, around 5.30 p.m. He was delayed. He had meant to go earlier, but someone or some group had slashed his tires. It's a true story. And much later, as a matter of fact, very recently, a former forklift driver named Pat Gallagher came forward and made a, a new claim about McRae. He said that he had saved McRae from a serious fire just a few hours before his untimely death, an apartment fire. So around 7.30 a.m. on that day, April 5th, Gallagher, who was 27 years old, was on the way to work when he saw that a fire had broken out in McRae's apartment. And then Gallagher also says that he saw a man dressed in a boiler suit passing him by with a briefcase. And at the time, Gallagher assumed this was a neighbor of whomever's house was on fire. And so he talks to this guy, still unidentified, says, hey, you know, help me. There's there's a fire. There's a fire. And then the guy says, get this, Matt. The guy says, oh, oh, uh, I'm in a hurry. I got to go to work. And he runs off. And Gallagher thinks this is kind of screwy. Why would a neighbor be more concerned about punctuality at work? than they would be about someone dying in a fire. Furthermore, why would a guy in a boiler suit be carrying a briefcase, a tan briefcase, which later Uh, turns out to look a lot like, looks a lot like McRae's briefcase. Also, uh, what the hell is a boiler suit? Yeah, I don't I've got to find it out. I I don't understand what it is. You know, it's like a, it's like a onesie. Oh, it's coveralls. Yeah. Okay. I've never heard it referred to as a boiler suit. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So not to profile, but that's you can understand how young Pat Gallagher would think it's weird for somebody to be carrying a briefcase and rocking that kind of suit. It looks like something you would more, you know, more easily associate with a toolbox, right? For for certain. Maybe um, the briefcase had tools in it. There you go. Uh, I can imagine that. That'd be kind of cool. You wouldn't be able to fit a lot of important things into a briefcase unless it was a really big one. It was um, the 
world's biggest briefcase. Yes. Even then, you're going to really destroy the interior. And yeah, let, let's just say that was definitely weird. And this person was right to think it was odd. And then uh, Gallagher goes on to claim that he later saw this same guy parked in the middle of the road uh, near this this uh, road called Queens Drive. And this person was speaking with another driver. And then he saw the same car outside his workplace later that morning. And he claimed that he saw it several more times over the next few weeks in the same area, that Queens Park area. Right. Yeah. And most troublingly, uh, you know, the question is, why did you just come forward? Now, he says he originally gave all these details to the police whom he contacted first, but they never followed up with him. And according to one other rumor, McRae told one of his close friends, Donald Morrison, I've got them this time. Yeah. Before he headed off and was not seen again by Morrison. Uh, That's what he told this person, John, who I just keep mentioning from that that random article there uh, mm-hmm. in Electric, Electric Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. And it's the same. That's also the same story where that person came forward with their story and reported it to police, but nothing was ever made of it. He never heard back. Yeah. And another disturbing fact, when they find McRae's car, his briefcase that he always has with him is missing. So the official conclusion uh, per Detective Chief Inspector David Pickney was this, quote, Police Scotland can confirm following a thorough investigation into the death of Willie McRae on April 6, 1985, there were no suspicious circumstances, and as with all sudden deaths, a report was sent to the Procurator Fiscal, went on to add, pardon our gobbledygook here, went on to add, reviews by the Northern Constabulary and the Crown Office into the matter in 2010 and 2011 did not raise any new matters. Police Scotland remains satisfied that the investigation was conducted thoroughly and that the case was concluded once the report was sent. And with that, the Crown Council considered the case closed. But there were problems with the conclusion. There's all kinds of discrepancies. And we've been laying them out for you throughout this entire episode thus far. And, and it's, it's, it's just tough to state how many there were. Aside from the missing briefcase, the one that McRae always kept on him because he's a bit of a, a bit paranoid due to the break ins and just due to him dealing with some some powerful people and making enemies. That's, you know, that, or that's, he was he was just aware, Matt. Being well, paranoid yeah. doesn't well, always again, mean you're wrong. I didn't mean to put any spin on being paranoid as a negative thing. I just meant, yeah, he was paranoid about someone trying to take his stuff or get him. Um, and probably for good reason. There's more. There was all kinds of this new information coming out from people who experienced and, you know, an interaction with McRae um, that didn't come out while the investigations were, were happening. The gunshot wound. Right. That's weird. If if it's true, if we're to believe the story of the nurse, then a gunshot wound to the back of the head almost, in my mind at least, rules out suicide. Um, I can't imagine someone, if, I don't know if you're watching this on video, but imagine someone doing it that way, especially inside a vehicle, a cramped Volvo like that. Maybe. I don't uh, know. While they're driving, right? And then just letting the car go where it may. It also, we have to remember that McRae is a veteran. He has firearm experience. So why would he, why would he put a gun behind his head and fire directly at the brainstem like that? How would he manage the angle? What, what would motivate someone to make that choice? And what about the allegations that the gun was like that it, was fired more than once. You'll see reports that it was fired twice. Uh, no, no fingerprints on there, which is not impossible. But to be clear, McRae wasn't wearing gloves or anything that would, you know, easily explain why the gun did not have his fingerprints on it. Some sources say his fingerprints are on it, but I cannot find an official report with that. Same, same. And we have to be careful with this stuff. So uh, in in that spirit, let's talk a little bit about the debate regarding how far away or how close the gun was. Uh, I know this is something that drove both Matt and I crazy uh, looking into it. So there is the distinct possibility that the car was moved and returned before the discovery of the firearm. We talked about that. That may have been, that may have resulted in the car being placed further away. Again, the details get a little murky, but it's interesting to note that two separate independent 
what are called breakdown companies, towing companies, we call them in the U.S., two separate companies claimed that they were responsible for removing McRae's vehicle, but the couple, this is a lot of yes buts, the couple who initially reported the incident, the Crows from Australia, they contradict that that story. Uh, they returned a day later, they said, to find a lost glove of their own, and they could confirm when they got there that the vehicle was in the same location as it was when they first discovered it, curiouser and curiouser. And now what about what about the other people who came forward? What about people like retired police officer Ian Frazier, who was working as a PI at the time of McRae's death? Uh, private investigator. 2006, he comes forward and he says he had an anonymous client, an anonymous employer who had paid him to keep McRae under surveillance for weeks leading up to McRae's death. Or how about this November 2010 statement from former police officer Donald Morrison? Uh, who you, and both of these things, by the way, you can find in a Scottish Eye documentary. We highly recommend you check that out. This guy, as McRae's friend, said that McRae had allegedly been under surveillance by both Special Branch and MI5. Uh, they call them, uh, what do they call them? Special Division or Special, I forget exactly what they call them in the, the Scottish Eye documentary. But there is some compelling stuff here where there are several license plate numbers written down or identification numbers on these vehicles. And the Scottish Eye independently confirms that these are intelligence or these vehicles were used by an intelligence service. Right. The specific individuals driving have yet to be identified. But Coupled, coupled with those facts, coupled with the fact that we know McRae was also asking his police contacts to help him trace some vehicles that he thought were tailing him, and then coupled with the disturbing statements of the nurse, McGonagall, and the forklift worker, Gallagher, it is completely understandable why a growing number of people familiar with this case do not believe the official story. This is, this is going to be a little bit of a longer episode, folks, because there's one more gigantic twist to the story. We'll tell you what it is after a word from our sponsors. We've returned, and now we're into the land of conspiracies. There are several potential conspiracies afoot. At this point, it is safe to say that someone was definitely after information that McRae held. But what was this information exactly? There are two big theories. One theory, which is pretty popular in Scotland, is uh, has to do with McRae's anti-nuclear work. At the time of his death, as we noted, he had been working on plans to stop the dumping of nuclear waste from the Dunray Nuclear Power Development Establishment. For people who believe the government murdered him due to this activism, the burglaries at his home and office are almost proof enough because we know at least some of the stuff he carried in that briefcase, the one that went missing. They were documents related to his work fighting the uh, nuclear powers that be. The only other copies of these documents were at his office. And when his office was burglarized, those documents were the only things taken. So that's already pretty fishy, pretty nuclear fishy. But that, that is only one of the theories. It's probably the most prevalent, or it was for a number of years. But there's a, another theory, right, Matt? What if McRae was on to something else? Yes, according to stuff you can read in the Scottish Sunday Express, there are some allegations from 2014 that McRae may have been on to something else that very powerful and influential people were getting up to that he was threatening to expose or he was about to expose. You can read this article in Express called SNP Activist Killed Over Child Sex Files. The, the allegations here are that he had uncovered evidence uh, that officially alleged pedophile child abuse rings or a ring probably rings, in Westminster during the 1980s were real and were operating at that time. It suggested that he may have been murdered to keep this whole thing a secret and specifically to take away the evidence that he had uh, about all of this so that, and that would explain his, you know, 
his, the place where he lived being burgled and having his things taken and his briefcase being stolen. So those kind of work together there. Right. And longtime listeners will be familiar with the child abuse ring investigation, most notably uh, the habit of the UK government for stonewalling honest investigations into into the allegations here and for uh, only – only going public with proving crimes after someone had died, such as the notorious Cyril Smith or uh, Jimmy Savile. Mm -hmm. And these, uh, so there was definitely something going on. Uh, there, there are ongoing allegations of cover-ups at the highest level of the UK government, possibly so that they can use the evidence they've collected as blackmail. Right to exert political influence. It's a very unclean game, but other governments have done it before. And this, the most disturbing thing about this allegation is that the timeline fits. Yeah. McRae's death comes just months after a uh, Tory MP named Jeffrey Dickens had handed in his own infamous dossier to the then Home Secretary, Leon Britton. This dossier had what uh, Dickens considered to be hard evidence of an uh, uh, of an ongoing child abuse network. And that dossier was officially lost, or maybe destroyed, but officially lost. Express also spoke with the widow of a barrister named James Borders, a lady named Fiona Borders. And her husband, during his career, was involved in a number of child abuse cases, and she was convinced that McRae was on the verge of, quote, shaking the establishment to the core when he lost his life. She thought he got some information. It was actionable, which means, you know, it was legit and provable, and he couldn't sit on it. She said, unfortunately, he must have spoke of this list to someone he should not have, which led to his downfall. And then she has a quote that <laughs> we've yep. italicized and underlined in the outline, Matt, you want to do the otters? Sure. It is easy to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but at times, conspiracy theories are proven true. Yes. Yes. And, and Donald Morrison, McRae's old friend, agrees with this. He says that for many, many years, he... Well, he always believed McRae was murdered, but he believed McRae was murdered for unearthing evidence about nuclear waste. But now he is convinced that McRae was murdered in order to prevent the exposure of that high level child abuse network, which he also believes in that, which, again, has not been officially proven or acknowledged by the UK government. And he said this there was a, a ring the, this ring existed on both sides of the border, exists in Scotland. Uh, he also said he was being harassed, receiving anonymous death threats, that his email had been hacked, that he had been followed or placed under surveillance. Yep. Uh, Morrison is so fascinating. I, I would head over to the Express right now if you want to, if you have time. Read the article. I will sign affidavit tying MI5 to McRae murder. Read the one we just mentioned here, uh, death threat letter for ex-cop friend of SNP activist Willie McRae, again, about Morrison. You can read the allegations that we just mentioned in that other article, SNP activist killed over child sex files. Check you out can, the Scotsman, the dude, truth yes. about activist Willie McRae's tragic death. Yeah, yeah yes. You read... All of this stuff, and you can see what we're talking about, especially uh, just as as the web seems to tangle in upon itself. Uh, really interesting stuff here. But Morrison in particular, as someone who knew him really well, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good source. Close, close friends. Uh, so McBray's friends and others interested in the case, including the president of the SNP at the time, started to be certain they were being stonewalled by all official channels. And this led uh, other folks like Mark McNichol to set up an independent campaign, something called the Justice for Willie campaign. The Justice for Willie campaign launched its own investigation because the government refused to conduct further inquiries. They hired two PIs to re-interview witnesses from the time of McRae's death. The results were published in 2016, 
And the campaign said they were unable to find any new evidence to undermine that suicide verdict. It's also worth noting that some of Willie's own relatives don't believe he was murdered, uh, especially not by MI5 or special services. Fergus McRae, his brother, has consistently agreed with the official suicide verdict and does not give credence to claims of cover-up or conspiracy. For now, that's where the case stands. Was McRae driven to suicide by stress, despite being on the cusp of several, you know, great legal victories and battles? Was he murdered to prevent the public from learning what he knew? Uh, And if so, by whom and for what reason? And will the truth of his death and what he may or may not have discovered remain something they don't want you to know? Yeah. Uh, we, we don't know the answers to these questions. Did you see the thing, Ben? I forget which article says this, but one of them says, or it's an allegation that Willie McRae had already been handed a few driving under the influence offenses. And the allegation is that he was aware, like he crashed his car because he had been drinking while driving to his other house. And he killed himself out of embarrassment, knowing that the third offense would be really bad. I, I don't know if I give any credence to that story, but it is at least something to think about while it's out here. There's a report that there was an encounter between McRae and someone else. I don't know if it was Morrison or someone else, but they stated that just as he was leaving Glasgow, he had two bottles of whiskey or alcohol And they had a bit of an exchange and he was excited that he was going to his essentially vacation house for a couple of days off or a week or two off. And he was going to enjoy both bottles with a small dram for the evening. So there is definitely an indication if you were to believe those stories that he was going to be drinking that night. Just, you know, did he partake beforehand? We don't know because we don't have toxicology reports. Right, because there was not an initial assessment done. So these questions remain, and we want to hear from you, listeners in Scotland, listeners abroad, anybody familiar with this case. What do you think happened to Willie McRae and why? Uh, Let us know. We try to be easy to find online. Yes, on Facebook and Twitter, we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, Conspiracy Stuff Show. On YouTube, Conspiracy Stuff again. On MTG Arena, conspiracy stuff um what else <laughs> oh yeah I'm, I'm still i'm still working through that i'm gonna i'm gonna get on arena you gotta um, find me uh, it's really easy to friend i didn't know you could easily friend people uh, okay yeah well I'll, I'll try to get on it this weekend but as you know i have a, you, know, you and i have a super secret project that takes <laughs> takes a that lot you, of that you have to do time. all the work on. <laughs> no uh, no no <laughs> no we're double dragoning it uh you can also if you don't care to sip the social meats uh you can give us a phone call directly. We've got a phone number. It is 1-833-STDWYTK. Three minutes. Those three minutes belong to you and to you alone. Uh, give uh, Give us a cool nickname to refer to you as. Let us know if we can use your voice and your message on air. And then, uh, Spill the conspiracy beans. Shoot the conspiracy breeze with us. Especially love it when we hear suggestions for new topics that you think your fellow conspiracy realists would enjoy. If you have a story, an experience, an idea that needs more than three minutes, don't feel like you have to keep calling the phone number. Don't feel like you have to edit yourself. We have one way for you to contact us any time of day, any time of year, anywhere you are with an internet connection. You can write to us directly. We read every email we get where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. And before we go, shout out to you, Sam and your bike vigilantes. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.